Welcome everyone back to FX Street. It's 8.30 a.m. Eastern. Today is Tuesday, November 15th, 2011. Welcome back one and all. Great you could join us. We have a lot of economic numbers uh, scheduled actually right now. So let's take a look. And we have a lot to talk about as well, of course. Uh, we're expecting U.S. PPI, Producer Price Index, it will be released right now. Here's the economic calendar. U.S. PPI, we're expecting 6.3% uh, of year over year. Retail sales in the U.S. expected is 0.3%, and that would be a decline. Here's the U.S. PPI. Okay, so we're waiting for this, waiting for these numbers to be released. Welcome everyone to FX Street. Uh, what we want to talk about today are the big issues that we that we're looking forward to throughout the rest of the year. You know, we're halfway through November at the moment. And here's a chart by the way. And we have a lot of big issues which have really in a sense handicapped the market and it's a phenomenon we've been talking about that I've been talking about for quite a while. Is that if you look at, well, you know, here's a perfect example, actually. Uh, you take a look at this Dow Jones Special Average chart. We marked off the months of the year because we typically expect the market to behave in a certain way during a certain, during a certain period of time of the year. July is known as earnings season. January, April, July, and October. We we'll expect a lot of volatility, a lot of volume, a lot of trading action. That did not happen. Take a look at the volume, which is uh, these green and red bars uh, almost all the way at the bottom of the chart. The volume and the volatility in July was very, very bad. It was very, very low. July is supposed to be one of the most volatile months of the year. Now, the, you know, we've talked about this in the past. The reason why this is is because the entire world, in terms of investments and trading, we're waiting for this debt ceiling debate to, to pass. Well, the debt ceiling debate passed, and then all of a sudden the S&P, Standard Poor's downgrading U.S. credit rating, <clears throat> and the volatility that we expected to see in July was pushed forward and delayed until August, but August it did occur. Huge sell-off in the stock market, RSI crosses below 30, huge amounts of volume, and the ATR rises. That was supposed to all occur in July, but all of this was, de was delayed because, again, of the debt ceiling crisis. Well, then in September, we expect to be moderately slow, and, you know, obviously, the volatility in August is not normal either. August is supposed to be a very slow month of the year. It's supposed to be one of the, actually, the slowest months of the year. But it was actually one of the most active months of the year. So that quiet, those quiet markets that the markets really have to, you know, really need in order to reset before the next big move, did not have happened in August. It was pushed forward until September. And even that was pushed forward until October. Now, October is supposed to be a very volatile month of the year, just like July. It was not. Take a look at the volume in October. Continued to depreciate. The RSI moved, uh, the RSI actually moved up because the stock market was strong, but it settled off, meaning we did not see huge, huge extremes except for the very, very end. And even that was not a lot. The real, ba the best indicator, I think, to use in terms of, uh, in terms of the, the stock market, it's volume. We don't really talk about volume in the foreign exchange market because it's a decentralized market. But point being is that we were supposed to see a lot of volatility and a lot of volume in August, in October, I should say. It did not happen. Well, what did happen was that that pushed forward until November. Now, November is also supposed to be a pretty volatile month of the year, not so much because of earnings, although we do have earnings, but more so simply because we're coming to the end of the year. Traders are squaring off their positions before the end of the year. That's why stocks sometimes go down in October and go down a lot because traders are taking profits. They're selling their winners and they're selling their losers to offset those capital gains. That didn't really happen. So what we're looking for now in November is something that we should have seen in October. The market, once again, has picked an issue. There's actually a few issues. It's picked an issue uh, that... It's decided to focus on, and the market, I talk about the market like it's, you know, a person, it's not, it's, it's the collective of all of us, of all the buyers and all the sellers getting together every single day, trying to decide where prices should be according to our interpretation of the fundamentals. Well, 
the, the, the volatility has still not come back and the volume has still not come back because the entire world is focusing on two big issues. Number one issue is Europe, Greece, the debt contagion crisis in Greece. Will Greece default? Will Greece, uh, Angela Merkel of Germany said the other day that no country will be kicked out of the Euro, but that any country is free to voluntarily leave the Euro at any time. Well, will Greece leave the Euro? And what we've seen over the past week or so is this phenomenon of this debt contagion fear that has spread from Greece, and we've seen this in the past. It's not the first time this happened, but it hit pretty extreme levels over the past, you know, five trading days or so, where the fear has spread to other countries. And we talk about fear, specifically we're talking about the bond markets. The bond market, very, very interesting markets. I, you know, I've said this for a long time, I think the smartest, the smartest uh, market out there that pays the most attention, most amount of attention to, to, to the fundamentals is the bond market. Stock market tends to focus on corporate earnings and our expectations of how many movies could Netflix sell, how many iPhones is Apple going to sell. There's a lot of emotion that goes into stocks because, you know, we all own stocks in our 401k plans, our pension plans, and we hope for our own reasons that these stocks go up a lot. But the bond market, not so much the case. The bond market we buy out of security, but the bond market mostly moves under, especially the government bond market, you know, U.S. 10-year bond, uh, the 10-year German bond in, uh, in Europe, it moves under the weight of fundamental data. By the way, these numbers were released. Uh, U.S. PPI was expected at 6.3% in its producer price index. The actual number, 5.9%, missed expectations and shows a one full percentage point drop since last month. Last month, PPI year over year was 6.9%. This month, 5.9%. U.S. retail sales were expected 0.3, a little bit better, 0.5%. By the way, the overall, uh, I'm sorry, the PPI excluding food and energy. So if you take out food and energy, 2.8 versus 2.9 consensus, so below expectations. Uh, New York Empire Manufacturing, uh, that will be, that it was released. It looks like it was a little bit better than expectations, but still nothing great. Uh, manufacturing shipments in Canada better than expected. Okay. So we have this deep debt contagion crisis in Greece, but if you look at the bond market, the bond market uh, conveys its, its message through the yields. When stocks go up, yields tend to go up because the bond market has to offer investors a higher interest rate or a higher yield in order to entice them away from stocks. When my stocks go up 50% in one day, the bond market has to offer a higher yield to give me at least some sort of competitive, you know, competitive rate. When stocks go down, yields tend to go down. That's under what I would say normal situations when there's not a risk of default. That's why you have the 10-year U.S. bond near 2%. The 10-year German bond actually uh, below 2% and the 10-year U.K. bond a little bit above 2%. Because the 2% level reflects more or less the expectation of how the economy is going to, how, how the economy is going to perform. But then you have countries like Greece and Italy and Spain and Portugal and Ireland that have also a risk factor factored into the price of the bonds. And if you look at 10-year uh, bonds in Greece, they pay somewhere around 28%. Is that because the stock market in Greece is so much stronger than the stock market anywhere else in the world? No, absolutely not. It's quite contrary. But the bond market is saying, hey, we have an X percentage chance that we're going to default, meaning... We're not going to be able to pay the investors back on their initial, you know, their initial payments in, 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 the, in the bonds. The bonds might be worth zero. They might be worth 50% of what, they, what, what we thought they were going to be worth. So we have to pay you a much higher yield. Because otherwise, who, who you know, would want to buy Greek bonds if there is an 80% or 90% chance that the bonds won't be worth anything? Well, the bond market says, okay, we understand that there's a lot of risk, so we're going to pay you a lot of yield, 28%. What we've seen over the past week or so is that uh, we've seen the bond yields in other countries like Italy last week cross above 7% for the first time, uh, I think historically, since the inception of the Eurozone. The 7% level is a big deal because 7% was the level that I believe that the other bonds, 
I think in Ireland and in and once upon a time in Greece, when they first and maybe Spain, no man, Spain's not there quite there yet, I don't think. But when the countries first had to ask for EU, European Union uh bailout money was when the bonds crossed seven percent. All of a sudden Italian bonds crossed seven percent, the yields went above seven percent, the entire investment world said, Uh oh, uh the yields were seven percent. Maybe Italy needs bailout money. But the fact of the matter is Italy is not Greece. Greece is a small Mediterranean economy. Uh, Italy is the, represents the third largest bond market in the world. And a lot of people say Italy is too big to fail. It's also too big to bail, meaning it's Italy's, the Italian uh, economy is so big, uh, the EU literally does not have enough money to bail them out. That's why the Italian bond yields going above 7% were so scary. Uh, yesterday, we saw yields in France go through the roof. We saw yields in Spain yesterday go through the roof. So uh, this is this is what's happening in terms of the European debt crisis. So the market's watching very very carefully the bond yields. Now, when the bond yields, by the way, go up, and this is to answer your question, Solomon. Uh, when the bond yields go up, what happens is the debt that that country owes internally and externally. Their debt also goes up. Imagine we owe, you know, ten thousand dollars on a credit card. Well, we owe ten thousand dollars on a credit card at five percent. What happens when the credit card company all of a sudden raises our interest rates to six percent? Our debt goes up. Well, as our debt goes up, we have, we're less likely to be able to pay off the debt. I mean, if I have ten thousand dollars in credit card debt to begin with, it's an indication I'm having a hard time paying off that debt. What happens when my interest rates on that debt go up? The debt rises which means I become even more of a risky borrower, so to speak. And the credit card companies get more nervous and they say, oh, oh, you know, he couldn't pay his his credit card bill when it was at 5%. At 6%, he has a much less chance of paying the bill. He, I think this, I think Adam looks like a high-risk client. Let's raise his interest rate to 7% and it begins to snowball. And that's really the risk in these bond yields going up. It's not just a sense that the bond market is sending us a message. The bond market, by the very nature of how the market behaves, meaning that when there's a higher amount of risk, yields go up. When yields go up, it actually damages that economy because there's less, Italy now has less amount of time in order to pay off those bonds. Now, to answer your question, the high bond yields are for the old bonds and new ones. Basically, the way it works is this. When a bond is issued and they have auctions, you know, every, every week, every couple of days all, all over the world, you know, the U.S. government and all these other governments will auction off new bonds. Well, the auction, again, represents the buyers and sellers coming together, deciding, uh, deciding what the price is. How much are we going to pay for these bonds? Now, a bond, when it's issued, is always issued at $1,000. I mean, you know, I think that it might be different, a little bit different for government bonds. I'm, I'm pulling from my bond classes, which I took about <laughs> more than 10 years ago. But a bond is issued at, at parity, $1,000. It could be an increment of 100000 for other types of government bonds, but let's say $1,000. And the bond yield at that time is 5%. And I think it's important we talk about this, by the way, because this is the big issue in Europe, is that the risk is leading to higher yields. The higher yields is making all of this risk more risky, making all of this debt more debt, you know, increasing the debt, and in turn, it's it's leading to a lot of uh, a lot of fear. Now, again, a bond is issued at a thousand dollars, and on the bond, it's written, "We're going to pay you, you know, this is worth a thousand dollars." And right now, the bond is paying a five percent dividend, five percent yield, dividend yield, same thing, interest rates. All of a sudden, well, let's say that, that country gets into a little bit of trouble and their debt to GDP ratio goes below 100%, and we said, uh oh, I think this country's in a little bit of trouble. Well, the bond market says nobody wants to buy your bonds anymore because it looks like a country's in our economy is in trouble. We need to pay investors a higher yield. We need to bring the investors back. Give them 6%. Now, this is again, the bond market's not one individual or even a group of people, it's the entire world. You know, I'm, I'm putting it into, into terms like this, so it's a little bit easier to understand. But basically, it's the entire world saying, you know what, I'm not going to buy, you know, those government bonds at 5% anymore. There's a lot of risk out there. I'm not going to buy those bonds unless they pay me at least 6%. So the bond market, the yield goes up to 6%. Now, what happens to your bond that you 
bought at a thousand you paid a thousand dollars for and it's paying you five percent. If you can now go out there and buy six percent bonds, your five percent bonds are gonna be worth a little bit less than they were before. Would I still pay a thousand dollars for a five percent bond? No. I'll pay nine hundred and fifty dollars for a five percent bond, or I'll pay a thousand dollars for a six percent bond. And then the economy gets a little bit worse and now the new bond yield which fluctuates. It's a yield which fluctuates on, on in, in the market. Actually, to be perfectly correct, the price actually does fluctuate as well, but it gets a little bit more complicated. But essentially, uh, as the bond market offers higher yields, those old bonds that you bought at 5% are not worth $1,000 anymore. Now they're worth 950 or 900 or 850. So if somebody wants to go out there and buy a 5% bond for whatever reason, they're not going to have to pay $1,000. They're going to pay less. Question is, any idea to what the criteria ratings agencies, Moody's, Fitch, and S&P downgrade upgrade ratings for countries? Thanks. Excellent question, and you read my mind because it's exactly uh, the second point that we wanted to talk about. The two big issues uh, coming into the end of the year. Number one is the issue, obviously, with the European debt contagion price and the, the fear spreading from one economy to another. And as that fear moves from one economy to another, we see the fear in the bond yields that are rising. The Spanish bonds, I don't have my, my bond sheet open, page open right now. Uh, bonds in Spain were around 6.5%, Portugal a little bit higher than that. Again, Italy is below 7%, last I checked, but uh, bond yields uh, were above 7% last week. French bonds, not that high. I think they're around 3, 3.5% if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, that's issue number one. Issue number two is the U.S. debt ceiling debate that led into the S&P downgrade, which now leads into the super committee, which leads into the super committee crisis. Okay. In the U.S., we have a budget deficit. We spend more money than we make. So we have to, we have to basically maintain a debt ceiling. We say to ourselves, okay, this is how high we're going to allow the debt in this country to go, 13 trillion, 14 trillion, et cetera. And if we get up to that level, that ceiling, we need to do something. We neither need to cut costs, and I actually I heard a great analyst talk about this yesterday. Uh, we either need to cut our costs, raise taxes, or do something so we're not spending as much, so we're making more than we're spending as a country. Well, we came to that point this past July. But all of a sudden, maybe because, well, a lot of it because of political reasons, uh, because we uh, because of a lot of political reasons, the the U.S. Congress was not able. The leaders, you know, in charge were not able to come to an agreement because one side says, you know what, we have a debt ceiling crisis. We have to raise the debt ceiling. Uh, let's raise taxes. The other side that says, no, 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 we already paid too much taxes. Let's, you know, we're not going to raise taxes. Let's cut benefits. Let's cut, you know, whatever entitlements, whatever it may be. And this is the argument that's going all over the world. There's no easy answer. Well, if you remember last July, the Democrats and the Republicans, the left and the right wing, everybody got together on TV in a very public forum. And I can almost guarantee you, they probably didn't think about this at the time, how bad it looked. But if you remember the debt ceiling crisis, the crisis was, was these politicians were gone on TV and were into every single, you know, uh, uh, politician got on TV and in a very public forum said, no, 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 the other side's wrong, we're right, we're not budging, this is the way it's going to be. Well, to answer your question, why was the U.S. credit rating downgraded from AAA rating, which is about, you know, our credit rating for the past 100 years, now to AA plus? It's not a big deal. I mean, it's not like, you know, there's there's an anticipation the U.S. is going to default on its credit, on, the, on its bond, bond investments. But still, the U.S. credit rating was downgraded because S&P, Standard & Poor's, said we do not have the confidence that the U.S. has a political, I forget the exact term they use, whether it's political will or political consensus. Basically, there's guys at Standard & Poor's that are watching TV in July and said, you know what, look at these politicians, they can't agree on anything. You know, one side says this, the other side says that. 
they were not even able to agree. The only thing that everyone could agree on is that they have to raise the debt ceiling. Because, by the way, if they don't raise the debt ceiling, there are these emergency triggers that get triggered, and that immediately that immediately calls into effect massive spending cuts. Massive spending cuts across the board. Defense has to be cut. Entitlements have to be cut. This has to be cut. That has to be cut. And nobody, none of the politicians really want that because these drastic cuts, like an emergency measure, it's sort of like an airbag, you know, we, or, or better yet, a seatbelt. We're driving down the road. It's raining and we lose control of the car. Well, our first line of defense is to hit the brakes, try to get control of the car again. That was raising the debt ceiling, cutting revenue, uh, increasing revenues, cutting spending, or a combination of both. That didn't work. We skid off the road and we hit a tree, and let's say the airbag doesn't deploy because the politicians were too busy arguing about what kind of airbag to use, right? <laughs> so the last resort that saves us at the last minute are these triggers, and that's a seatbelt. And the triggers basically say, okay, We've reached the debt ceiling. We can't go up any higher than the debt ceiling because it is a ceiling. Therefore, it automatically entails massive cuts across the board. For the left wing and the right wing, for everybody involved, everybody's going to get cut. Nobody really wants that. That is why S&P downgraded, to answer your question, Ben. That is why S&P downgraded U.S. credit rating. It's not because of the debt ceiling. It's not because our deficit or maybe because our economy looks so bad. It's because they don't, they don't believe, S&P does not believe, that the U.S. has a political will to to actually resolve its differences. Now, question is, uh, so with hyperinflation, bondholders lose uh, big time on holding bonds. Hyperinflation occurs, you know, we have inflation, prices rise. We have deflation, prices go down. Inflation usually occurs during strong economies, you know, when we make more money. Well, unfortunately, yeah, I mean, it's the S&P... By the way, Vince, uh, S&P downgraded. It was, I believe, I mean, look, I mean, there's there's a million people in the market and a million opinions as why the markets move. Uh, but we nobody really knows. We only know the reason why we buy and sell. But to my best knowledge, you know, from all, everything I've read and I've watched on TV, that I think that S&P downgraded U.S. credit rating because of the political insight. Yeah, it wasn't so much economics. I mean, if it was economics, you would you would have other countries. France has a triple A rating. I don't know necessarily if their debt to GDP ratio is higher or lower than the U.S. It might be actually a little lower. But France obviously is entailed in the middle of this European debt contagion crisis. So if it was just economics, if S and P just downgraded the U.S. credit rating because it's, hey, look, their economy is not strong, well, then I'm sure that S and P probably would look at France and say, well, I know their economy is a little bit stronger. A, a look at look at the mess that they're in. You know, look look at look at the risk that they're in sharing a, a euro currency with, you know, economies like uh, Greece and Italy that are in a lot of trouble. So yeah, I think it was political. I don't want to forget about my the the other question. So, um, so let me go back. To, okay, so hyperinflation. Hyperinflation occurs. We know inflation occurs when the economy is strong. When we make more money. We charge more prices for our products and services, whether we own our own business or we work for somebody else. Either way, our salaries go up, our income goes up, we spend more money, we buy more, we consume more. The prices for everything else that we consume go up because more people are making money. Prices go up, the economy strengthens, that's inflation. Eventually, when inflation begins to get a little bit out of control, then the Federal Reserve or Central Bank will start to raise interest rates and to slow the economy down. Deflation, obviously, is the opposite. We lose our job. We spend less money. The manufacturers have to cut their prices. Producers have to cut their prices, which, by the way, we saw today, PPI, Producer Price Index. Prices go down to bring the consumer back into the shopping mall, and everything works in a cycle. The Federal Reserve has to raise uh, lower interest rates to stimulate the economy, which is what we're at right now. Hyperinflation occurs, if I understand the term correctly, is that it, hyperinflation occurs when prices go up and go up a lot, but prices go up not as a result of business being better. I mean, we still have 9% unemployment in the U.S., uh, and we still have a GDP number, gross, gross domestic product number, barely above zero, not farm payrolls, 
come out every month, 100,000, 50,000, 200,000. Non-farm payrolls need to be on average near 400,000 every month in order to maintain pace of the economy. We need to see GDP in the U.S. at 3, 3.5% 3 every single month in order to break even. We're not seeing that. But yet we saw prices on uh, oil, $100 a barrel. Gold, $1,700 an ounce. All these other metals, platinum, palladium, uranium, etc., uh, have gone up, and that hurts the consumer. The consumer says, hey, I'm not making any more money. Why are all these prices going up? Look at the price of food because of the raw materials. Raw material prices, commodity prices have gone up. Now, food's more expensive. I'm not making any more money now because of this recession, uh, but that's hyperinflation. So, yeah, so in terms of hyperinflation, bondholders, yeah, when you talk about hyperinflation in terms of the bond market, I think it's when the, the, the prices of the yields, where the yields go up so much. Remember, if you own a bond and you paid $1,000 or 5%, if the Greek bonds now pay 28%, how much could that 5% bond possibly be worth? Five cents on the dollar, 50 cents on the dollar? I don't know what the math is, but it's not good. With hyperinflation, do you see rise in interest rates? It's another great question. Put yourself in the shoes of the central bank. Uh, you're in charge. All of a sudden, we, you know, we get the job tomorrow, we're gonna run the Federal Reserve. Should we raise interest rates or lower interest rates? You know, keep interest rates where they are. Well, one side of the coin says, no, keep interest rates low because the economy needs all the stimulus it can possibly ma you know, manage. We need people to buy homes. We need people to buy cars and other big ticket items, which is the whole reason for, you know, zero interest rates in the U.S. for two plus years, uh, quantitative easing one, quantitative easing two, operation twist. That's all done to keep interest rates low because the economy needs to help. But then again, prices have gone up so much in food and oil. Uh, maybe we should raise interest rates because that should slow the economy down, that part of the economy that's actually doing very, very well. European Central Bank, a couple months ago, if you, don't, if, if, if you don't recall, raised interest rates. Now, last month, they cut interest rates. We have a new president, by the way, which has, I think, a lot to do with that. Uh, it's not just a one-time event. But European Central Bank, their mandate all central banks mandate is basically price stability, in other words, inflation, and growth, in other words, jobs. Jobs and inflation. That's the mandate of the Federal Reserve in the U.S. and most central banks. Now, the central bank, European Central Bank, they raised interest rates a few months ago because we were not in this European debt contagion crisis the way we are now, yet prices were going up a lot. The German economy is very, very strong. The French economy is very, very strong. The other kinds like Greece and Portugal, you know, they, were, they, they didn't look that good, but they didn't look that bad either. Not the way they look right now. Let me show you something, by the way. This is a chart. Uh, there we go. Yeah, this is, this is a chart. I mean, if you, if you can't see this. The uh, violet line is the zoo, which is a German investor confidence number. Basically, pulls every single month a number of uh, investors, a very large amount of investors in Germany, which again is is one of the strongest economies, probably the strongest economy in the eurozone. Uh, and ask them what do they think about the future outlook of the German economy. Now, in order for Europe to recover, Germany has to recover. Germany has to do well. Take a look to see where the zoo was not too long ago. The zoo. And by the way, the blue line is a euro-dollar currency pair. The zoo is at 56 August of 2009. Now, uh, and it dropped to negative 4.3 September of last year. Then dropped to negative 37.6 August of last of, of this year. Today's number, brand new number today, November 2011, minus 55.2. It is the lowest level we've seen since November of 2008. Remember where stock markets were in November of 2008? That's where the zoo is now. The lowest low is 63.9 in July 2008. And that matches the low, actually a little bit below the low of 62.2, going back to 1992. In other words, another bad report. If we break below the 63.9 level of July 2008, and by the way, we're at 55.2, it's not a big move that we would need. That would put us at levels at least going back to 1992 and the worst levels we've seen so far. 
That is how bad uh, the investor confidence is in Germany right now. That's the difference between where we are now, where we were just six months ago, or maybe let's say a year ago. That it has not been a smooth, steady, slow trend to the upside. It was, but then things have turned. So, okay. So the hyperinflation, do I see a rise in interest rates? Well, would we raise interest rates in the Eurozone now based on what we see in the, in the, in the German zoo number? No, I would say absolutely not. And that is really the risk of hyperinflation, the fact that we have to spend more, but we're spending more and we're not making more, and we're spending more while things actually get worse that was created by a publicly traded company. You know, clothing or, or cell phones, computers, homes, anything. Everything goes through the banks. And that's why when the banks aren't lending, progress literally grinds to a halt. Currency worth less makes it more difficult to pay for stuff. That's inflation. No, couldn't have said better myself. So yeah, so to get back to the second big issue, which is the S&P downgrade, there are now rumors that, not rumors, there is an idea, and it always starts with an idea, that number one, either France may get their credit rating downgrade, and they still do have a AAA rating because of the toll that France's economy has suffered as a result of the European debt crisis, you know, and other, other countries in Europe. But number two, that the U.S. credit rating might also be at risk again. Because remember what happened. In July, we had this debt ceiling debate. Everybody got on TV and they argued. In August, they said, uh-oh, quickly, let's, let's, everybody let's agree to raise the debt ceiling. Another $1.5 trillion. They raise the debt ceiling. They said, that's going to buy us time. How much time? Until the end of the year. Very shortly after that, the president came out and said, we have a new jobs plan. We're going to, you know, extend unemployment benefits and, you know, invest in bridges and roads and tunnels and schools and all that good stuff. And it's going to cost us another $400 billion, but don't worry, we're going to put into the, the super committee is going to find a way to pay for it. Now, by the way, the super committee, I think there's six or 12 of them. I think it's six and six. Uh, we have a bunch of Democrats and Republicans who gone together, and they have to decide where we're going to get the spending cuts from by November 23rd, which, by the way, November 23rd is the day before Thanksgiving, and November 23rd is two-day, and we know stock markets are obviously closed on Thanksgiving, and November 23rd is two days before that Black Friday. Black Friday is that big shopping day, the day after Thanksgiving, when everybody goes back to the stores. Next week is going to be, I think, one of the most important weeks of this year. Because the Super Committee, I cannot believe it's only, let me look at the calendar again. It's November 23rd. Today's the 15th. Yeah, so Friday's the 18th. Uh, in fact, a week, eight days from now, the Super Committee has a deadline. They have to come up with a proposal that they're going to send to Congress, that they're going to say, we agree to raise a debt ceiling in August, and now this is our proposal. We're going to need to raise revenues here. We're going to have to cut entitlements there. We're going to have to do this. We're going to have to do that. And that's how we're going to pay for everything that we spent in August. It's like basically the, you know, the credit card company, we told them in August, please help me out. I'm really, I don't have any money. Raise my debt, my debt limit. I have a $1,000 credit card, and they just raised me the $2,000. I already owe a thousand dollars, but I can't pay that. So I asked the credit card company raise raise it. The credit card company tells me how are you going to pay for it. I told them I said I don't know, but I promise you by November 23rd I'm going to come up with a plan. <laughs> when you put into these terms, that actually kind of sounds ridiculous, right? Well, November 23rd, eight days from now, the super committee has to come back and in front of the world and the world is watching, say okay. We raised the debt ceiling in August. This is the way we're going to pay for it. Now we're going to send our proposal to Congress, and then they got to get together and they got to argue. And then I think by the end, of, before the end of the year, I think it's December 23rd. Congress actually has to vote to to actually put this into law. It's a lot of big ifs. And so far, from what I've heard, the super committee is not quite there. Now. Imagine, well, not imagine. Remember what happened in August. S and P downgraded the U.S. credit rating. Why? Because of the political infighting. We couldn't agree on what to do. So we kicked the can down the road. We said, raise the debt ceiling now. We'll figure it out later. Well, later is now. Now is later. Now they have to come up with those, with these, you know, spending cuts and revenue increases or a combination of both. 
And it's not, you know, we're not here making a political opinion at all. This is unfortunately the situation that we're in, all of us together. Uh, so that is the other big, you know, 5,000 pound gorilla in the room, so to speak, is the debt ceiling crisis. What happens? And remember those stock market, the stock market went down a lot in August in the U.S. because that, that was the catalyst. Was we had very slow markets and we were waiting for something to happen. The debt ceiling was raised, that happened, but then S&P says, uh-oh, we don't like it. Now, I want to talk about some other things, but if this was not enough, the fact of the matter is when, when, you know, when we have to rely on politicians to make a decision on our behalf, we have to consider what kind of mood they're in. And we're in an election cycle here. We have elections, presidential elections, in one year from now. So we have uh, Democrats and Republicans and everybody getting together. Everybody has become a super politician at this point. So I think, my opinion, is that these politicians are going to have a very, very difficult time finding anything that they can agree on with the other side of this, of, of, of you know the the aisle politically because we're an election cycle and you know everybody has to defend their own party. Questions and with all the German data, Euro still hanging at 130. Amazing. It is a very, very curious phenomenon why the euro is still at 130. I have some opinions, by the way, in terms of that. Jim Rogers said he will shrink the bonds with both hands, wonder how the bonds can go down. Uh, much of him make that statement. Well, shorting bonds, I'm assuming he's shorting the bond, which means he's anticipating yields will go up. How would yields in the U.S. go up? Well, and I'll, and I'll give you, I'll explain, I'll, we'll go through this, I'll base this on my own personal, uh, experience in losing money. <laughs> when there was the first, when there was the first to talk, first talk about the U.S. credit rating might be downgraded back in July, I, you know, I, I watched the bond market passively, and I really don't have any experience in terms of these type of economies. I mean, I, you know, I've been around watching the charts since the 1990s, but I don't think we've ever had anything like this before. So when I thought, when I heard that there was a, prob a possibility that the U.S. credit rating would be downgraded, I, like many other amateur bonds, uh, bond guys, said, you know, if they downgrade the U.S. credit rating, that means, that implies that the U.S. has a higher amount of risk. And if there's more risk, the yields are going to go up. Well, I went out there, I bought options betting that the yields were going to go up, that bond prices were going to go down. It didn't happen. I lost all my money on, that I bet on those options. Thank goodness it wasn't a big bet, but <laughs> nevertheless, I lost money on it. The bond yields in the U.S. did not skyrocket, even though the, the, the credit rating was downgraded. Why are Greek bonds at 28% and Spanish bonds at 65 and Italian bonds at 6 and something percent yield? Why are those yields so high in the U.S. 10-year bonds? I'm talking about all 10-year bonds as an even comparison. Why are the U.S. 10-year bond yields still 2% and sometimes below, below that? Because there's still not that risk component. The people do not believe, the bond market does not believe that the U.S. is going to default under credit rate, under, under, under bonds. Now, there, it's not a black and white situation where the yields will go from 2% to 16% in one day. It's all various, various shades of gray. But I think the situation where the bonds will go down and yields will go up is that the U.S. credit rating is further downgraded. And remember, I lost money the first time this happened. So, you know, I don't exactly have a good track record <laughs> as far as uh, this is concerned. But the, the two ways I could see the bond yields in the U.S. will go up is either if stock markets go up and we have a huge economic recovery, not even huge, if we have an economic recovery and the stock market goes up, bond yields will go up. We saw that the past couple of months, bond yields were 2.2, 2.3%, now they're 2%. So bond yields will go up, bonds will go down if stocks go, stocks go up and the economy recovers. Or bond yields will go up and go up dramatically if all of a sudden the bond market says, uh-oh, I think there's a lot more risk. So, and Jim Rogers, I mean, he's a, a very, very smart guy. But he happens to have uh, an extremely long-term opinion about the market. He makes very, very long-term bets. I mean, he was making bets on commodities when nobody was talking about commodities 10 years ago, more than that. So, yeah, I could see how Jim Rogers would, would 
completely expect that, that bonds would go down and yields would go up because he's probably looking at the possibility of U.S. recovery three, five, ten years from now. In terms of the euro, by the way, and there's so much else I want to talk about. I didn't mean to get stuck on this topic. So there's a lot else I want to talk about here, but it's all interesting stuff. Uh, why is the euro still at 130? Because, well, I'll give you my opinion. And then we'll get to this RBA, RBA news. The euro dollar represents those 17 countries the euro currency, I should say, represents the 17 currencies that share that currency. Spain, Ireland, Greece, Portugal, Germany, France, and a lot of others. The euro dollar daily chart, we're definitely off of our highs, that's for sure. We were at 150 going back to uh, you know May of this year, and that was the result of a weak dollar, strong stocks, the recovering economy, all that good stuff. Why is not the euro dollar parity? One five zero 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 zero. A couple different reasons. First of all, the debt contagion crisis in, in, in Europe. It's assumed, I think, by most. I mean, I can ask, and I, I ran to this poll in the past. I think I did this poll uh, a, a couple a couple weeks ago, where I asked everyone in the room, "Do you think what is the possibility that that Greece will default or Greece will be saved?" I could ask all of you right now. There's 35 people in the room. If you think that Greece will default, type in the word default. If you think it will be saved or rescued, type in the word rescue. I'm guessing the, the vote was very, very skewed towards default. You know, we're going to see right now. Default, 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 default. Maybe one vote for rescue, right? Well, if Greece defaults, the euro doesn't suffer. It's only bad for Greece. Because all of a sudden, Greece, I mean, if you think about it, Greece doesn't use the euro anymore. The euro is not you know, burdens with the risk of, of the Greek economy, the euro does just fine. The euro is now Germany and France and the other stronger economies minus the weakest economies. Plus, it sets a tone. It says, well, if Greece got into this kind of trouble and they defaulted, uh, what happens uh, if Italy gets into this kind of trouble? What happens if Spain gets into this kind of trouble? What happens if Spanish bond yields are 28%? Maybe Spain will leave the euro. Well, then that's good for the euro. What I think would be bad for the euro is that if if Greece is left in the euro and then the rest of the European using countries, the euro using countries basically have to pay for Greece, then that would that would be bad for the euro. But I think the market consensus, I mean we look you know, we have we have what? Uh one, two, three, four, five, six responses, five of them say defaults. I think if you ask any six people in the world, I think the, you know, you're going to see a, a very big ratio. And that perception right here is why the euro is so strong. You say, if Greece defaults, fine, they're going to default. They'll use a Greek drachma. They won't use a euro anymore. They won't be able to accept any EU stimulus, euro stimulus, because euro stimulus is designed for the European countries. And, you know, if Greek defaults, then it's a very small economy, and the IMF, you know, maybe the U.S. and there's other, you know, other bodies out there can get back together and help Greece through the worst of, worst of it. Number two is our friends at the Swiss National Bank. Remember the Swiss National Bank? They intervened. They said, enough is enough. We're an export-driven economy. The Swiss is very, very high because of the price of gold and because the dollar is so weak and the yen is so weak. Uh, I'm sorry, the other currency is so weak that the dollar is strong, the Swiss is really, really strong, and, but this is really, really hurting us. A Swiss franc that is so expensive, and Swiss, Switzerland is an export-driven economy as well, they export banking. I always make this joke, but imagine the ATM charges at, at, uh, at a banking machine in Switzerland with a Swiss franc being so high, meaning if me coming from the U.S., if I were to take it a vacation in Bern right now in Switzerland, if I went to the ATM machine, to the bank machine to take out money, how much, you know, in the U.S., what's it, $3, $4? But what if I have to pay three or four Swiss franc? Now, obviously, banking is a lot more than ATM. It's private banks, it's wealth management, things like that. But all of that becomes a lot more expensive. Well, Swiss National Bank intervened. They said, we're selling Swissy, we're buying everything else, and especially the Euro Swissy. 
and they mention a specific price level, 120 Euro Swissy. And we have unlimited amount of resources and unlimited amount of resolve. We will defend Euro Swissy 120. And that was a successful intervention because we can see the, the Euro Swissy after breaking above 120 never crossed back below or 124 right now. And there has been more talk of the Swiss National Bank saying, you know what? That's not even enough. We want the Euro Swiss to be higher than that. Well, when the Euro, when the Swiss National Bank intervened, and they mentioned, they didn't talk about the dollar Swiss fee, they didn't say the Swiss CN, they didn't say the, the, the pound Swiss fee, they said Euro Swiss fee, which leads me to believe that the Swiss National Bank is buying more Euros than any other currency. Maybe that's also helped the Euro stay so strong. The fact of the matter is, foreign exchange market moves as a result of buyers and sellers. We just added in the Euro currency a very, very big buyer out there. Now, the euro has also been very strong because European Central Bank President, former President Jacques Trichet, said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lower interest rates. My number one concern is inflation. And we have inflation in, in Europe. We have inflation in Germany and France. We're going to keep rates high. Now, since then, Trichet retired and he was replaced with uh, Draghi, who subsequently lowered interest rates, I think, on the second day of work. But still, uh, I don't know that they're necessarily going to cut interest rates dramatically. So there's also the interest rate component to that, plus the fact that when stock markets go down, that the dollar uh, goes up. But lately, stock markets, I mean, we had a really, really strong October. Stock markets go up, it means the dollar goes down, the Swiss goes down, the yen goes down. We buy those currencies that represent a little more risk, like the euro. So there's a lot of reasons, I think, why the euro is up here. In terms of the U.S., by the way, going back to that, something I want to mention before, and I, I, it slipped my mind. And I'm running very, very short to being out of time as well, so I need to wrap it up uh, as well. But I think the one big risk component, a very big risk component in the U.S. is that, and I heard an analyst talking about this yesterday, that if the the super committee cannot agree and the con and and the triggers are put into place, these automatic triggers, these automatic spending cuts. But then Congress has the ability to actually go in and to manipulate these triggers and say, you know, we know we have an automatic trigger. We have to cut the fence by 20%, but we're going to pass another law. So we're going to override that trigger. That is a very big risk. So I think the political component in Europe and also in, in the U.S. represents the big, biggest risk. So we have to look forward to for the end of the year and the beginning of next year. Uh, but I don't want to lose any questions here. Uh, we can watch what happens here. Maybe those same problems will come to the USA. Yeah, absolutely. I like to say this debt contagion crisis is a virus. It spreads through the banks. After all, Greece gets in trouble. French banks that have Greek investments get in trouble. French banks go down. The German banks go down. Well, our investments into European banks, I mean, who would have thought it was risky to invest in a French bank, now represents more risk because the French banks invested in Greece. Look at MF Global Financial. This very big story that's passed, you know, been on, wall, uh, on, the, on the news for the past couple of weeks. Why was the reason that they got in so much trouble? They made a bad bet, a very big, too big of a bad bet, against uh, in Europe. So Europe has already begun to affect U.S. banks one way or the other. Uh, I really pause because we have so much more to talk about, but I am out of time. However, please see FX Roots calendar because we have a lot more to talk about uh, for the for the end of the year. If you have any questions, you can contact me directly at www.forexlaunch.com. I want to thank you all very much for joining us. Wish you a great day. All profitable trades. And we look forward to seeing you back.